Good morning, all, and a very warm welcome to Followers of the Way this morning. Well, we live in troubled times, don't we? And you don't need me to say that we're seeing a spiritual battle going on, a spiritual battle in the heavens and a spiritual battle here on earth. And nowhere is it more evident, I think, at the moment than in what's happening to Israel. Without exception, we'll all remember the horror of um, the news on October the 7th, that terrible massacre. But somehow since then, the narrative's been changed, hasn't it? There's been this propaganda war going on. And somehow now we're being told that, well, Hamas shouldn't have done it. But you know what? They were justified because the evil, Israel's been so evil towards them over the last year. So you know, they shouldn't have done it, but you can understand it. And just look what Israel's doing to Palestine now. And they shouldn't do it because this is genocide. And then on our streets, we're being told that um, the Israelis are so wicked. They, they've they caused all this, haven't they? What we're seeing is a, a demonic hijack of truth. That's really, um, it's that ancient battle being played out, isn't it, that is targeting God's people. And we are seeing in our country this rise of anti-Semitism. I think we've never seen anything like this in our country. Okay, in the last world war, we had shoots of it here and there, but not like today. And we really have got to stand against this demonic spirit of death and of violence that is trying to take over our streets and that is directed first and foremost at the Jewish community, but will at some point target us as well. I do believe that. We must stand against violence and discrimination like this. So I do commend to you, there's a meeting this afternoon, I don't know, I imagine you've all heard about it, uh, but it's going to be um, gathering at four o'clock, and they'll be gathering in Whitehall, just opposite Downing Street initially, but let's pray that the whole of Whitehall actually gets filled. And it's going on to 5.30, and it's just going to be raising a voice against this growing climate of anti-Semitism. And we do need to raise a voice because for the first time in living memory, I think the Jewish community is actually getting very frightened to be living here. And this, this does not belong in a democratic society. This is, this is not us. We are so much better than that. And our faith and our trust in the Lord means that we have to stand up against it. So if you can, please do go along. But if you can't, let's just be holding them in our prayers and pray that um, truth will shine out from our streets and that Israel, I mean, what's happening in Palestine is terrible. We'd all agree with that. But they are also in fear at this time. So let's pray for the protection, the divine protection of Israel and that um, Hamas will be exposed for what they are, because Hamas is a, a separate entity. Hamas is not Palestine. Hamas is a an evil group that has held Palestine in its grip for too long, has exploited the people. So let's, let's be praying for them and for the evil that is represented by Hamas to be exposed and to be dealt with, and for outrage on the part of the international community against this. Okay, that's my little um, tirade there. Uh, we, last week, we finished our series looking at the seven churches of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches at Revelation. And this week, we are very pleased to welcome as our guest speaker, Paul Luckraft, who is um, a Bible teacher, and a composer, and he has a real heart for Israel, for the Jewish people, and for Jesus, our saviour, who is Jewish. Did you know that? <laughs> Didn't we all think he wasn't? No, he's not. <laughs> so we're really pleased to, to welcome Paul Luckraft to be here with us today. And I just want to have a very short interview with Paul, just so we can all sort of get to know him ahead of time. Terrifying him. 
people ask you to do this, isn't it, Paul? <laughs> I'll cope, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good to have you with us. Thank so you very thank much for having me. Coming and being here. Okay, now you, I understand, are a retired teacher. Yeah. Now, I'm immediately curious, thinking, what <clears throat> subject did you teach? But even more after that is what led you into this ministry? Yeah, well, I taught mathematics at secondary school. I'd done a full career in that, um, 33 years by the time I retired early. Um, but I'd always been doing Bible teaching, which meant fitting it in, particularly in school holidays and so on. So uh, it really began, <clears throat> from the ministry point of view, if you like, um, almost at the beginning of my adult life because I became a Christian in my teens. But having retired about 11 years ago now, obviously I felt the Lord was going to open up new opportunities, give me new things to do. Uh, and take take over um, full time what I've been doing in my spare time. So I enjoyed 33 years of teaching maths, well, mostly. Um, and I'm enjoying in retirement even more now and doing this sort of thing. <clears throat> Sounds splendid. I said just now, that what's so distinctive about your ministry, your teaching, is that you, you have a real heart and a passion for Israel, <clears throat> for Jewish roots. But is this something that you've always felt, or is it something that the Lord led you into? Um, well, for a long time, I wouldn't say always, but I um, I mean, basically, I just read the Bible, and you sort of can't miss it if um, if you're reading the Bible with open minds, open hearts. But I went to Israel on a on a tour, I suppose that's over 30 years ago, and that made a big difference. And then I did two more tours, one with um, CMJ and another one with Chris Hill. Uh, so they were more study tours, more sort of informative from that point of view. And I think by the time I'd done three tours, I was absolutely convinced that this was an essential part of what I had to do, which was to pass on anything like this I, that I could learn for myself. So it grew from there, really. Um, and then just by following it up to listening to the right sort of people, I suppose, and reading the right sort of books over a long period of time. Okay, but why is it so essential? Does it really matter? Why? Well, it's interesting because obviously I, I go to various churches where for them it doesn't seem to matter. Um, and if you're just talking about basic Christianity or salvation, well, fine, there's lots of uh, good things going on. But to me, you, you can't really understand the depths and the background, uh, and indeed the future, without this Hebraic uh, understanding. You've got to go back to your roots in order to be able to understand the now and also press on into the future. So I do try and persuade as many people in my own fellowship and beyond that uh, really they're missing something if they don't think of uh, think of things in this way. It's a hard, hard task at times, but keep mm. persevering, and, and slowly but surely more people come to read the Bible quite differently, which is the main point. That makes sense to me. Paul, well, you've got a, a website, haven't you? I know you've um, yeah. got all sorts of exciting initiatives up there. Do you want to tell us briefly about that? Yeah, again, uh, it was only a couple of years ago, really, that I thought that uh, with all the things that I'm doing, it would be good to join the the, the masses of people who have websites. Um, so with the help of a friend, we put one together, uh, and it's mainly so that I can put short talks on it. And I like to do really short talks of about 15 minutes to go on there so you can absorb it in, in sort of small bites and have a cup of coffee at the same time, but you can extend it um, over a whole series, if you like. So um, that, that's called Orchard Seeds, if you're not familiar with uh, what I've been doing there. So it's www.orchardseeds.com. And there's quite a few series now of short talks, including one that I've just started on... Uh, biblical wisdom, um, which is why I've picked this topic for, for today. Not that I'm repeating what's on the website yet. <laughs> I'm giving you something that's going to be on the website in about six months' time because it's a very long series uh, and I've only just got going and it's a long, long-scale project for me, this. But you'll be able to catch up on a lot more on the theme of biblical wisdom if you want on my website. And in the meantime, there's uh, stuff on the Jewishness of Jesus, uh, the kingdom of God, I, I did a whole series on Nehemiah. Um, so anything like that I do now, uh, there's a website for me to put, put up what I do. Sounds brilliant. Thank you. It, it is .com. That's something I sometimes tell people wrong, wrongly. I'm fairly sure it is. Hmm. <laughs> it's all just these .com. But I'll, we'll have a check. <laughs> I'll make sure. Uh, yes, and so will I. <laughs> I've told people wrong before. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Paul. <laughs>
Okay, let us just commit now the uh, our, our service to the Lord. Father God, we just come before you in awe, Lord, at your majesty, your greatness, and yet your love for each and every one of us. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be with us now, and will guide us in all we say and do. Lord, that we might be acceptable in your sight, and that our praises might rise to your ears. In Jesus' name, amen. And now Anthony is going to lead us in worship, please. Good morning, church. <clears throat> Anthony here. Um, we're going to sing a song, How Great Thou Art, which is, uh, I'm sure you all know, is a wonderful hymn. But uh, I want to tell you a little bit of its story first. So originally it was written by um, a Swede called Karl Boberg in the 1880s, one summer evening, after he was, had been admiring the beauty of nature and um, the sound of the church bells. He published this, and uh, a few years later he heard it um, sung to a traditional Swedish folk song. Following that, it was translated into German by an Estonian called Manfred von Geln, and uh, that in turn was translated into Russian by Ivan uh, Prokhanov in 1912, two years before the start of the First World War. In the First World War, there was an Englishman serving uh, by the name of Stuart Wesley Keane Hine. Now, he and his wife, after the war, became missionaries in the West Ukraine of Russia. And they often sang it as a duet. And eventually he went on to uh, translate from the Russian into the English, uh, the words. And it was made popular uh, in the United States during the Billy Graham uh, Crusades in 1955. So there you go, from Sweden to Germany, to Russia, to England, to the United States. And I'm, I'm sure it's sung all over the world in various languages. So I just wanted to share that with you because I thought it was absolutely wonderful, isn't it? And now here we are, we're about to sing it um, online, digitally. There you go, nice little story. Okay. How great thou art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made, I see the stars, I hear the Sings my soul, my Saviour God to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Saviour God. I wonder and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Sings my soul, my Saviour God to 
cost and comes in power for you and me. Therefore, we lift our hearts in praise and sing to the living God who saves. in praise and sing to the living God who saves for grace oh beautiful song i am uh, sorry i think i got the second verse a bit wrong there never mind you know what i'm like right the next one is called he is lord and i think i learned this one uh, during the charismatic renewal in the catholic church in the 1980s in a place called ampleforth abbey and i'm sure a lot of you know this one <clears throat> it's very true we can't sing this and we're we're not followers of Jesus. And if we can sing this, then we know the victory is already won. So this is a victory song. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord every knee shall bow every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord he is our our Lord. He is risen from the dead and he's our Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you are Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus, you are Thank you, Anthony. He is Lord of Victory Song. We're all a work in progress, aren't we? As the Holy Spirit uh, comes alongside us and conforms us to Christ, who remakes us 
in the image of Christ, that we might be fully what God has made us to be and what he intends us to be. And we cooperate with the Spirit in that process by confessing our sins so that we open ourselves for him to come into us more fully and to uh, to remake us. So now we're going to confess those ways to the Lord that we know that we have fallen short this week in thoughts, in words, in what we've done and what we haven't done. As we remember those failings, so we ask the Holy Spirit to come into us and to help us and to change us. So we say together, Almighty God, long-suffering and of great goodness, we confess to you with our whole hearts our neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, our wrongdoing, thinking and speaking, the hurts we have done to others and the good we have left undone. O oh God, forgive us for the ways we have sinned against you and raise us up to newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we know that God's love for us is such that when we come to him, when we confess where we've fallen short, then his love engulfs us and he forgives us. He calls us home. So now we say, Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to your truth, strengthen us to do your will, and give us the joy of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now I'm going to invite Denise to come and give us our reading this morning. Yes, yes, good morning. Um, I'm reading from the Complete Jewish Bible and we're in James. So starting at James, um, the first chapter of James, verses 1 to 8. From Yaakov, because uh, it's James, that's J, the, the Hebrew for James, a slave of God and of the Lord Yeshua the Messiah, to the twelve tribes in the diaspora, Shalom. Regard it all as joy, my brothers, when you face various kinds of temptations. For you know that the testing of your trust produces perseverance. But let perseverance have its complete work, so that you may be complete and whole, lacking in nothing. Now if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all generously and without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in trust, doubting nothing, for the doubter is like a wave in the sea being tossed and driven by the wind. Indeed, that person should not think that he will receive anything from the Lord, because he is double-minded and stable in all his ways. Now over the page to uh, chapter 3, and verses 13 to 18. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him demonstrate it by his good way of life, by actions done in the humility that grows out of wisdom. But if you harbour in your hearts bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, don't boast and attack the truth with lies. This wisdom is not the kind that comes down from above. On the contrary, it is worldly, unspiritual, demonic. For where there are jealousy and selfish ambition, there will be disharmony and every foul practice. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure, then peaceful, kind, open to reason, 
full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And peacemakers who sow seed in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Thank you for your word, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Denise. And now before Paul comes and opens that word to us, let's just pray for him. Father God, we just ask now your anointing upon Paul. Lord, may your spirit rest upon him and speak through him. Guide his words and open our hearts and minds to hear what it is that you have to say to us this day. And Lord, be blessed in your name. Amen. Paul, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much. As I said before, it's really nice to be with you and uh, to share on this topic, which is absolutely fascinating me at the moment. It's going to occupy me for several months because I'm engaged in a sort of whole Bible study of um, of this particular topic of wisdom. But I wanted to bring something to you from the book of James, because that to me is where the whole thing is heading. It's where we get really excited by the whole theme of wisdom. Uh, and in particular, that verse that was read from the first reading in chapter one and verse five, that if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And every time I read that, I think, sort of, wow, what a fantastic offer, free wisdom. All I have to do is ask. Now, the Bible contains many wonderful offers and promises from God, doesn't it? Uh, uh, but this one, this one is one that I think we really all do need, even if we've been Christians for a long time. If anyone lacks wisdom, you, me, and you don't need to pass any particular test, undergo any checks, there's no fault finding involved. If you lack wisdom, just ask. Free delivery is guaranteed. And you don't get that in any supermarket. The best offer you get in the supermarket is perhaps buy one, get one free. Well, this is buy one, get one free, but you don't have to buy one. Just get it free. And who would want to turn down an offer like that? Although I admit sometimes suspicions do creep in, don't they? Can it really be that good? Is it genuine? Surely there's a catch somewhere. You know the sort of thing we come up with. There's no such thing as a free lunch and you don't get out for out in this life, that sort of thing. So we've got to be careful that we don't turn it down out of suspicions and so on. And in fact, there is a sort of uh, terms and conditions clause that James uh, attaches to this verse, the small print that we have to read carefully. But in the next verse, he gives the warning. And when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. He's double minded and unstable. So there is something required of us as part of our asking, namely a firm belief in the goodness of God to grant our request. That he is able to do it, that he's willing to do it and that he will if we ask in faith. But if you're a Christian, then you ask God for things in faith all the time, hopefully. That's what a follower of Jesus should be doing, constantly believing that our Heavenly Father provides us with every good and perfect gift, also in James chapter 1. And we also remember the words of Jesus, don't we, when he says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened to you, for everyone who asks receives. So there it is, a wonderful offer. Is it an offer that you can't refuse when you take advantage of God's generosity? Well, I think we need to understand a bit more perhaps what it's about, what is wisdom, uh, and how we actually receive it. But that verse always strikes me as something that's really powerful when it comes to understanding uh, this topic. A powerful motivation for asking for anything is to have a real desire for what is on offer. Uh, we need to have a desire to become wise even to the point, perhaps, of it becoming a rather serious ambition in our life. Uh, can we justify calling being wise an ambition? Uh, why not? We have all sorts of other ambitions, sometimes uh, less worthy. I can remember when I was much younger, uh, much, much younger, I should say, uh, I had several ambitions. I was going to open the batting for England. 
I was going to travel the world as an international concert pianist, all sorts of things like that, until it struck me that for ambitions like that, you need talent. And that's where the drawback came, really, talent. Um, and although I still enjoy both of those things as a hobby, um, that's all they are, really. They're, they're, a, they're not an ambition anymore, obviously. But gaining wisdom is very different because you don't need a specific talent to become wise. And I'll stress that again later, perhaps. It's being freely offered and therefore it's available to anyone without preconditions. I say we need faith. You should have a desire for it, but you can ask for it without having any other talents and so on. <clears throat> uh, in Proverbs, one of the wisdom books, which obviously is part of a longer study on wisdom, we read the following. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So it comes from God himself. But did you notice in the second reading that we had from James chapter 3, that James warns us that there's two kinds of wisdom, categorized as either heavenly and earthly, or as worldly, uh, in one version I think it was. But it's all to do with their origins. There are more types of wisdom. There's at least two, which comes um, from different sources, and we need to clearly distinguish between them. So the source of wisdom is important, and James is warning us that not all wisdom, as we think of it, is from God. There is another kind, and it's described in very damaging and very dangerous terms. I think in the reading it was described as unspiritual and even demonic. In fact, in some versions, uh, at, that's, at this point, the word wisdom is put in little quotes. Such wisdom, so-called wisdom, what people think of as wisdom, if you like, doesn't come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, and so on. Now, it's the same word, the same Greek word, Sophia, but it's as though James is saying, that's not real wisdom. This so-called wisdom, well, humans may think of it as wisdom, but God does not. So we have to be careful. We have to get the right kind of wisdom, and we have to get it from the right source, if you like. Because if it doesn't come from God, from the spirit of God, then that's why James calls it unspiritual, which can be rendered also as just meaning uh, sensual, coming from our own desires, our own inner senses. It's something that develops within our own thinking, uh, independently of God. And, of course, that sort of thing is very attractive to people in the world. Let's think things through for ourselves. Let's ignore God. Let's put him to one side and work everything out for ourselves. That's why that kind of wisdom is very prevalent within uh, humanity. But that's why it's also dangerous to us, because it doesn't come from God himself. I think to understand a bit more about this need for wisdom to come from the right source, in other words, God himself, is if we go back to the very beginning and the Garden of Eden and that initial disobedience by Eve and then by Adam. I don't know if you remember what Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6 says, but it says three things, that when Eve saw the forbidden fruit on the tree in the middle of the garden, what did she see? That it was good for food, fine, pleasing to the eye, it's interesting, but also, it says, desirable for gaining wisdom. That's an interesting phrase that we often forget about with this sort of forbidden fruit, what was there. It was desirable for gaining wisdom, and that was the point of entry in which the, the devil could tempt Eve, I think. You see, this last phrase about desirable for gaining wisdom, uh, in Hebrew, the, the word uh, nekmad, which is used for desirable, is a very strong word. It's a powerful driving force. It's a great urge to seize something that you don't already possess. And it's actually the same word behind the word for coveting uh, that we read about in the Ten Commandments. But as we said, there's nothing wrong with desiring wisdom as such, but that's within the context of asking for it from God. In this case, Eve's desires have been stirred in the wrong direction by listening to the tempter. And she therefore saw the tree differently and began to rethink. Here's a quick way to gain wisdom. 
just take and eat. Here's the easy option, but not the right one. This was grasping rather than asking. This was taking for yourself rather than receiving something as a gift from God. So wisdom itself is not a forbidden fruit, but how you get it and where you get it from does matter. You can't fast track true wisdom in a way that's out of step with the Lord. And in the end, Adam and Eve realized that their action did not lead to greater wisdom. In fact, it led to considerable confusion and a loss of ability to see things as they really are and God as he really is. Asking God for wisdom is part of a continual relationship with him. It's not something you just grab and go. It's something that you take on board as part of your daily walk with him. Receiving wisdom is not something that comes all at once in its totality as a single delivery. And after that, you can ignore God and say, thanks, that's it. I now got the gift of wisdom. I'm completely wise in everything. I don't need you anymore in all this. True wisdom comes from walking with God over the course of a lifetime where you keep asking for more wisdom whenever you need it. And that's not the way that uh, Adam and Eve grasped at it. So that's the source, I think, of where there is this, this other type of wisdom that's come into our world. See, what we can't do is take wisdom and, and make it a sort of idol in itself. It's very tempting, isn't it, to think, yes, if I can get wisdom, then, well, I'll be wise and I'll be able to uh, do anything I want and it'll all be for me. And I'll get lots of people saying, oh, how wise he is, how wonderful. Uh, and give me lots of applause and sort of honour. In fact, the gift of wisdom that God gives uh, isn't for our self-promotion or personal honour. It's in order to serve him and others. And uh, if we were just out to to get people to acclaim us as being particularly wise, then we're not asking God for wisdom in the right way. And no doubt he will therefore uh, not give us that for those sort of purposes. But if it's to seek uh, to serve other people and indeed to honour God, bring him glory, then he will give us his wisdom. It's worth just uh, pointing out as well that Paul is also aware of these two kinds of wisdom and how they clash because they really are opposites. They really do fight against each other, the wisdom from above and the wisdom from this world. And at some point, perhaps you'd like to follow this up in the opening couple of chapters of uh, 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to read part of it now from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So listen carefully to where the, the idea of wisdom comes in on this. Paul writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. And then he quotes from Isaiah. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? This is Paul again. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, Paul was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. He goes on that the Jews demand signs, the Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. I think that's the, the sentence towards which the whole study of biblical wisdom is heading, Christ the wisdom of God. And Paul adds, the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And then his own testimony is, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom. And don't forget, this is Corinth, this is Greek, where they loved wisdom. They loved uh, finding out what people thought and uh, listening to people speak uh, and with their own wisdom. And Paul said, we, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom. So here we find in the first two chapters of 1 Corinthians, perhaps the most concentrated exposition of wisdom in the New Testament, certainly from Paul, as he attacks the pagan wisdom of the Greek world and explains how the wisdom of God, and especially that of the gospel, is opposed to it. And if we try and preach the gospel using worldly wisdom, it loses its power. 
And we've got to preach Christ crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, earthly wisdom says man's in control. He can make his own decisions without reference to God. He can work it all out for himself. Whereas what heavenly wisdom is, is God telling us the real meaning of everything that we see, that we do, and how life works when he's allowed to be in charge. I'm sure we're aware that human wisdom remains a very powerful force and it dominates our world around us. It's promoted by the education system, the entertainment industry, the media in all its forms, and it's still very tempting. And we can't remain neutral in this. We've got to recognize the difference between the two and make sure that we exchange earthly wisdom for heavenly wisdom by taking up God's offer. Paul, again, in in Ephesians, prays for them that he says, I keep asking God to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I keep asking because you keep needing this. This is something that you've got to receive, not as a one-off gift, but live out in a regular basis. Now, I said I'd come back to one or two other important things, and here's one of them. It's very important to realise from the outset that being wise is not about knowing lots of things. It's not about being smart or learned. It's not based upon intelligence or a high IQ. Nor is it exclusive to those considered to be clever. In fact, clever people are not always the most wise. I don't know if you've noticed that, but look around and you'll probably see that that's really true. In fact, in many ways, cleverness, learning, you know, having a high IQ and knowing lots of stuff, that can block out the sense of any need for the real wisdom that comes from God. It will tend to focus, through its pride and self-sufficiency, on the earthly wisdom rather than the heavenly wisdom. Of course, there's nothing wrong with education, with learning things, or developing your, your mental abilities and your intellectual gifts and so on. But that in itself is not going to make you wise. Now, wise or being sorry, wisdom, being wise, it can use our existing knowledge, our existing skills. And in fact, something I haven't got time to go into is how very often in the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, wisdom is focused more on practical skills and abilities, not anything intellectual or, or, um, or, or academic, certainly not. Uh, it's all about being able to do things. It's a very practical sort of wisdom that God gives. But although wisdom can draw upon our existing knowledge and our skills that we know God has given us in the first place, this special wisdom from God goes further and beyond. It takes us further by helping us to apply what we already know and can do, particularly in new situations or situations that would otherwise defeat us. Wisdom helps us to survive in difficult circumstances and to help us avoid tricks and traps that might otherwise destroy us. God's wisdom alerts us to deception, fake news, lies, half-truths, and it protects and guards our life when danger threatens. It indicates the right direction to follow and the correct path to take. Above all, true wisdom is about making better decisions and good choices. By way of illustration, consider the humble tomato. Now, you may have heard this before, but it's quite nice, worth repeating. Knowledge tells you that the tomato is a fruit. Wisdom tells you not to put it in a fruit salad. Well, not usually anyway. Um, so it's worth knowing something. It's a fruit. But it's worth having the wisdom to know but what does that mean I actually do with it if I want my meals to taste nice? And it also stresses that wisdom is essentially practical. It equips you for the tasks that God gives you, whether they're mundane or indeed very large scale spiritual ventures. One of the uh, interesting things with any character in the Bible is to look through what he does and says and ask it every time. Is that being wise? Is he being wise here? And obviously you can do that with Solomon, which is part of the longer study, because Solomon asked God, or God said, ask me whatever you like, 
And he said, I need wisdom, otherwise I can't rule properly. And so God was very pleased with that, and he gave him wisdom and a lot more. And to start with, Solomon appeared very, very wise indeed. But it's an interesting study to realise how eventually, although he's still wise for other people, he wasn't that wise for himself. And he made lots of mistakes, uh, because I think he basically um, got too proud with all his achievements that he didn't keep asking God for the right kind of wisdom. Uh, and uh, we can do this with any other person in the Bible. Uh, look at how they uh, asked for and applied wisdom in various circumstances. So wisdom enables you to get things right that you wouldn't normally get right if you relied solely on your own skills or knowledge. Wisdom from God provides something extra and helps you to put to better use what you already know or can do. I would summarise it as saying that wisdom is suddenly knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. It tells you where to go when you don't know where to go and what to say when you don't know what to say. For instance, remember in the Gospels how Jesus warned his disciples that one day they would be brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, but they weren't to worry about how to defend themselves or what to say in these difficult times. Jesus assured them, I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. And that same idea is repeated elsewhere, where in this case it says it would be the Holy Spirit who will teach them what to say at such times. That's how Jesus was going to give them the words and the wisdom that was needed at the same time. So that's part of the promise of asking God for wisdom at the times when you need it. And suddenly you need to know, what do I say in this situation? And as well as knowing what to say and when to say it, I would suggest that part of being wise is realising when it might be better not to say anything at all. Sometimes the wisest course is to keep quiet. If you remember in the book of Ecclesiastes, which again is one of the wisdom books of the Old Testament, there's a wonderful section in chapter three about a time for doing this and a time for doing that and so on. And this part of it is there's a time to be silent and a time to speak. So there's often a time for one thing and another time when the opposite is just as important or more important. And wisdom helps us decide which course of action is the correct one and when, because circumstances might dictate that sometimes it's best to be quiet rather than to say something. Wisdom is about making better choices, better decisions, and sometimes the right time to make a decision. And that can be crucial because in decision making, sometimes it's the timing that's wrong rather than the actual decision itself. You might make a decision straight away or too early and it might be disastrous, in which case the correct decision was to not make a decision or at least to delay it. But on the other hand, indecision can be harmful. We need to make a decision. So what do we do? Do we look before we leap? Or is it the case of he who hesitates is lost? There's two proverbs for you that seem to contradict each other, but they don't really. It's a matter of, well, which is the wisdom that we need for this situation or that situation? Both are wise, both are true, but then we need to ask God for the wisdom to know which one we trust at a particular time. So let me summarise now um, as I finish. Uh, God's gift of wisdom, freely available, just ask in faith, have a strong desire, make it an ambition, and so on, and then he will give. No talent needed, no great sort of intellectual prowess or anything like that. God's gift of wisdom, freely available, will provide you with an understanding, a better understanding anyway, of life and how it works because it comes from the one who made us and gave us life. And his wisdom will tell you personally how to get the most out of the particular life that you have been given, how to successfully play the hand you've been dealt, if you like. And as part of this, wisdom helps us in the more difficult times in our lives, times of disaster and suffering and difficulty. It enables us to think through what's happened and possibly why. It, con it counteracts, prevents us from having knee-jerk reactions and negative responses 
which can be helpful. We just stop and think and ask for wisdom and we make a better response than we might otherwise do. It stops us getting too angry too soon or indulging in self-pity and so on. Wisdom from God gives us a correct perspective, which then empowers us to make positive responses. So wisdom is particularly helpful in the difficult times of life. So um, there's quite a lot there, but uh, that to me is the exciting part of asking God for wisdom, that it's freely given and it can make such a difference in life when you're stuck, when you need uh, fresh uh, direction, help with choices, decisions to make and so on about what you do, where you go and so on, which is the wise move, not necessarily what looks good in the first case. So um, I'm going to finish there and uh, hand back to whoever I hand back to. Uh, and I gather that at the end, uh, I've got to hang around so that you can uh, ask me further questions if you want to, which I'll be very happy to do. So thank you for that. I'll hand back now. Thank you, Paul. Yes, if you will hang around at the end, that would be absolutely splendid. And thank you for those insights into wisdom. Wisdom, the gift of God, freely given to all who ask. And I think Paul's just shown us too, though, the dangers of earthly wisdom. It's so easy, isn't it, to rely on earthly wisdom and to get seduced into thinking that's the way. So it all comes down, doesn't it, to our relationship with Christ, who is the wisdom of God. That's where it starts. It's the beginning and the end. Let's just pray, uh, asking for that gift and just submitting ourselves. Father, we just thank you for this word. And we thank you for the gift of wisdom given to each one of us, Lord, as we ask. Thank you for that gift that never fails. Lord, we ask now that you will open and incline our hearts to you to seek after the wisdom that comes from above. And we pray that we might distinguish it from that earthly wisdom that seduces us with all the pros and cons and the arguments, Lord, that don't lead to life. Lord, just please, we pray, place your gift within us now and build us in your strength, that we might truly be your people and might serve you in faithfulness, in endurance, with courage. Lord, may your wisdom be ground in us and become to us that path to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So now let us declare our faith to the highest heavens. Let us speak out what it is that we believe that comes from God. Let us say, here we stand to the highest heavens and let us glorify God in this declaration. So stay muted, but join with me in saying, we believe in the Holy Scriptures as originally given by God, divinely inspired, infallible, entirely trustworthy, and the supreme authority in all matters of faith and conduct. We believe in one God, eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, his virgin birth, his sinless human life, his divine miracles, his vicarious and atoning death, his bodily resurrection, his ascension, his mediatorial work, and his personal return in power and glory. We believe in the salvation of lost and sinful man through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, by faith apart from works, and regeneration by the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit, by whose indwelling the believer is enabled to live a holy life, to witness and work for the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in the unity of the Spirit of all true believers, the Church, the Body of Christ. And we believe the resurrection of both the saved and the lost, 
they that are saved unto the resurrection of life, they that are lost unto the resurrection of damnation. This is our faith, and here we stand by the grace of God. And now I'm going to invite Lynn to come and lead us in our prayers. Um, lots of overlap here. How encouraging that is. Dear Heavenly Father, we worship you as the all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful and ever-present one. We bow down and thank you that you are Lord over the nations that are but a drop in a bucket. You are the everlasting one, always watching and working out your purposes. We thank you, Father, for your encouragement to call on you for wisdom and truth. And as James says, you give generously as long as we ask fully believing and trusting in you. Lord, when Solomon thought how to live and be a king, he asked of you and he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he, the Lord, will direct our paths. Now, Lord, here lies the issue, the issue of trust. And we confess, Lord, that so much of the time we rely on our own understanding and wisdom that comes from self-reliance and opinions. And, Lord, even this week we've seen in the Synod how opinions can cause struggles and stress and separation, not only in the Synod, Lord, but amongst leaders and churches. And we see opinions battering people. And we say, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy, O God. Lead us into brokenness and repentance and humility amongst our leaders, Lord, and amongst ourselves. Lord, we acknowledge we're self-opinionated. We are too big for our boots too elevated in our self-abilities at times. Lord, I praise you that a time of great uncertainty when King Isaiah died, Isaiah had a vision. Lord, it was a time of great possibility of national insecurity and he saw your holiness. He saw something of you high and lifted up your train filling the temple and the words of worthy, worthy, holy, holy echoing all around him. Lord, that completely undid him. Woe is me. Lord, I pray that you will give us, your children across the nation, a holy perspective. Break in, O Lord, and give us understanding and revelation of your holiness, that we will indeed put ourselves on the cross and to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, to be crucified with you. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. We want to see you, Jesus, who is wisdom, that we can change and we can be hearers of your word and doers of your will, your wisdom, and your word. Earlier this week, I had a surprise in the night at two o'clock in the morning. I was awoken to see my curtains, which were closed, with a big red blood stain on them. I thought I was seeing things. It's not happened to me before, this kind of thing. And I kept blinking and looking away and then coming back. And it lasted a whole hour of huge red blood stain. And I began to thank the Lord that it's the cross, at the power of the cross, the power of the blood of Jesus keeps us safe, protects our home. But far more than that is the answer because the heart of the matter is the heart of us. The whole problem of unholiness and evil is our heart. 
And it's as if the curtains need to be opened up and people see the message of the power of the blood of Jesus, what he accomplished on the cross. And as Paul said, the wisdom of God was the crucifixion of his son and the resurrection. Lord, we thank you. And Lord, the meditation you showed me of how you saw the Hamas terrorists that everyone and all of us agree are doing the most despicable, evil things. And Lord, we are asking them to give up their hope of some life on earth, but also their hope of an eternal paradise. Lord, they are trapped by a demonic lie, as Lord, the whole world is under the influence of Satan. And Lord, the only solution is something bigger and greater, and that is to see you, Lord Jesus Christ, what you have done on the cross. So, Lord, we pray. We pray for all preachers and speakers and witnesses that we may testify to the power of the cross, the power of what you accomplished, because there only can we die to all sin and all evil. Lord, I pray for an elevation in church, elevation in all Bible studies and groups, that we may extol you as the Saviour who died on the cross. And Lord, too, I want to pray for those that are your followers, your disciples in this nation who are directly dealing and surrounded by the world's opinions and the world's problems, which are sin. Lord, I pray for parents. Give them the wisdom, Lord, to know how to speak and to care, to protect and provide for their children who go out into school unaware of so much that is around and in the world and through the TV. Lord, I pray for us as family members to know how to witness and to speak and to have your wisdom. And sometimes, Lord, as Paul said, to say nothing. Have your wisdom when being with our family. Lord, I pray for social workers, so often having to put a plaster on huge, great problems that are around in society and family life. Lord, may they know your wisdom. Lord, I pray for teachers in schools and the battles and struggles they're facing to hold fast to that which is true and right. I pray, Lord, for wisdom. Lord, I pray for your children who are counsellors and psychiatrists. Lord God, we know they're not allowed to say certain things. But Lord, I pray you'll give them wisdom. I thank you, Lord, that we can hear and live in your perspective with your wisdom. And we can work practically. And as James said, that we can count our trials as joy for you can give us that wisdom we need. God mindset, God's opinion. And Lord, I pray for what's going on in the Middle East. Lord, I pray for your followers, your disciples. Lord, especially those are having to be in the IDF at the moment. Lord, James says that wisdom is pure and peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without impartiality and without hypocrisy. The fruits of righteousness is sown, the peace of them that make peace. Lord, how on earth I don't understand. But Lord, I trust you and believe and ask, O oh God, you will give wisdom to those who are fighting in the IDF. I pray, Lord, for those hostages, Lord, who have heard in school something of the Tanakh of the Old Testament. I pray, O oh God, you will stir their minds that they may seek you and have your wisdom. I pray, Lord, for all the believers in Israel who are under great stress of not only dealing with trauma, but having to provide for evacuees with very limited resources. Lord, I pray that there will be resources coming in. I pray for wisdom for them. And Lord, lastly, I pray for ourselves. Lord, indeed, we can be on the tube in London. We can be elsewhere on the streets. 
and we can feel threatened at times. But Lord, I pray that in the moments that we will have the practical wisdom to know how to be. And Lord, talking of the streets this afternoon in Whitehall at four o'clock, never again means not now. I thank you that thousands will be turning up and many others will be praying. Lord God, I pray for your protection. And I pray, Lord, that you will use this as a shining light and testimony to truth. I pray, O oh God, that you would demonstrate yourself, you will manifest yourself, that, Lord, there will be a witness to who you are and to the truth that evil must be resisted in these days. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world, and I thank you for the Christians that we there. May they be as lights in the world and carry your wisdom and your love and your truth. And I ask all these things for the glory of your name, for your purposes to be fulfilled in these days and in our lives. Amen. Amen indeed. Thank you, Lynn. And let's now gather all these our prayers together in the words that Jesus himself taught us. We say together, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And all praise to his name. We come now to that point in our service where we bring before the Lord the needs of any especially known to us at this time, those who are sick, those who are facing problems, those who are frightened or depressed, the anxious. We pray also for ourselves, our loved ones. And in a minute, I'm going to invite you to unmute and to speak those names aloud where we ask today for the Lord's special touch. So we bring to the Lord the sick and suffering, those who are heavy laden, those who mourn and grieve, those who are weary, tired, anxious. None of their needs go unnoticed by our God. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ bless and restore all those troubled in body mind or spirit that we now name before him. So now trusting in his love and knowing his will to heal and to save, we say, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the Spirit, may God in his perfect compassion restore all these we have named and speedily send them complete healing of soul and body, let healing come speedily, and let us all say, Amen. So now as we draw towards the end of our service, uh, we're going to ask Anthony to lead us in a final song. Shout to the North. All the great and glorious King You are strong when you feel weak In your brokenness complete Shout to the north and the south Sing to the east and the west Jesus is Saviour to all Lord of heaven Rise up, wind in all the truth. Stand and sing to broken hearts. 
who can know the healing power of our rose and king of love. Shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west, Jesus is Savior to all. of church with broken wings fill this place with songs again of our God who reigns on high by his grace again we'll fly we've been through fire we've been through rain we've been refined by the power of his name we fall deeper in love with you. You found this truth when I live. Shout to the north and the south. Sing to the east and the west. Jesus is Savior to all. Lord of heaven and earth. You will shout to the north and the south. Sing to the east and the west, Jesus is Savior to all, the Lord of heaven and earth. You're the Lord of heaven and earth. You're the Lord of heaven and earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Have a blessed week, everyone. Thanks, Anthony. What a glorious song to end on. It just remains to give the blessing and dismissal. So, God of power and might, reign over us soon and forever. May the kingdom of God's greater son be established forever. For then shall the words be fulfilled, the Lord shall be king forever, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. On that day the Lord shall be one, and his name one. So may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us and keep us this day and forevermore. Amen. To go in peace, to love and serve the Lord. And we say together, in the name of Christ, Amen.